At last, we are at the final section of the tutorial where I'm going to show you how to render out all the amazing things that we've done so far with Movie Render Cube. And this will cover how to set up the Movie Render Cube with master and short configuration, what are the supported output formats, how to set up the Movie Render Cube settings for path tracer and deferred render, and what are the most essential settings that you have to take care of. So let's take a look at it. So in order to render out shots, in Unreal, first you have to add the level sequences to the move render cube. There is currently two ways to do it. One of them is going into the window, cinematics, and going into the move render cube. It's going to open up a new interface where you are able to add new shots by clicking on the plus render sign or going into the content browser and drag and drop them. The other way, if you have already the sequencer opened up, there is this small button next to it. When you click on it, it's going to immediately assign the currently open level sequence into the movie render queue. So the movie render queue have a very simplistic interface. On the left side, we have a list of available shots that we can render it out. And on the right side, we have the details that belongs to those shots. We can change these settings individually. So here on the right side, we have the level sequence that it belongs to, and also the depth map that it has to open up whenever we render it out. On the left side, we have the available jobs, and we have the job name and the settings itself. And that's the very crucial part, because the settings is going to define how we are going to render out the level sequence. But I'm going to show you that later. So what you have to know that in the move render queue, we have not only just the job, but we have the shot settings. So there is a two level. One of them is the master, which is going to overall define how is it going to be rendered out. And the other one is that how it should render out shots on the individual shot level. If, for example, if we have this shot and we have multiple shots inside of it, we can define how it is going to be rendered out individually. Let's look into how can we define the proper settings for our movie render queue. To adjust the settings for the individual jobs, you have to click on it and it's going to open up a new interface. On the left side, we have the settings that we are available to choose from and it has three main parts, the exports, the renders and the settings itself. The exports where we are going to define how we are going to export it, which format, like is it JPEG, PNGs, AXRs or anything else. On the render section, we are going to on the rendering section, we are defining how do we want to have the renders. Do we want to have deferred rendering? Do we want to have path tracing? Do we want to have burn-ins or any other additional features that you want to have displayed on your renders? And finally, we have the settings, which is going to overly manipulate how we are going to render out each individual frames. These settings can be added with clicking on this plus sign. And you can see, for example, in the settings, we have the anti-aliasing, the burning, the camera. In the exports, we have the different formats. And for the rendering, we have all the different lighting scenarios. In our cinematics, we want to make sure that all of our renders are looking really amazing and pristine. But we have a little bit of a problem as we are working on a square-based grid system called pixels. So whenever we have diagonal or curved lines, they sometimes appear jacked. Thankfully, there is a solution for it called anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing is a technique to smoothen up these jagged edges, kind of like a magic brush, so they appear much more suited to your eye. To edit into your settings, go into the plus sign and search for anti-aliasing. Here we are presented with a bunch of properties, but don't worry, I'm going to walk you through one by one. So the first one is the spatial sample account. And spatial sampling is a way how many times a pixel is sampled per pixel in one frame. So just to put it easily, we have one pixel, and just imagine it as a square, and inside of the square, we are taking multiple samples and we are averaging them out. It is going to reduce the jagged looking edges alongside geometry, textures, or high contrast areas. And it's perfect for relatively low motion renders. The second parameter is the temporal sample count. Temporal sampling works that how many times a pixel is sampled over time uh, using motion between the frames. To put it easily, in Unreal Engine, we are using temporal anti-aliasing and it's taking the current frame and the previous frame and it blends it together. Anti-aliasing comes from multiplying the two things together. So the spatial and the temporal both count to each other and the system is limited to only use eight by default. So if I put nine here, notice that we have a system warning that, okay, something is wrong. But no worries, I can just modif easily modify it using the override anti-aliasing method. 
In the anti-aliasing method, we are presented with a bunch of parameters, such as fault approximate, temporal, multi-sample, multi and temporal score resolution. All of them have their own use case, but for cinematic processes, the temporal anti-aliasing is perfect. However, if you want to increase your anti-aliasing above 8 and you don't modify the project settings, I would definitely recommend that always use the none and just increase the amount of what you want, like let's say 2 here for the spatial sample count and the 8 for the temporal sample count. Two other amazing things what we have here is the render warmer count and the engine warmer count. The render warmer frames is perfect for getting rid of the temporal effects such as anti-aliasing. And the engine warm count is perfect for warming up the whole system that are GPU based, such as Ni Niagara system, or like just waiting for the textures to load. The next key topic to cover is to define the proper export format. In Unreal Engine, the standard config file comes with JPEGs, but it is not ideal. In the standard cinematic productions, we usually render out frames with XRs because it's linear and also it supports high dynamic ranges. On top of all this, it retains all the necessary information without modification. Also, it's lossless, and uh, if, if you want, and also if you want to make any kind of post production, it's a must have feature to support it. To add it, go into the settings and choose the XR sequence. Here we have different compression method, and also if you want to have multi layer or single layer setup. For multi multi layer setup, you are able to add additional information to it. In this case, like we want to remove all the additional export formats because the, with the move render queue, we can define multiple ones and it's going to render out sequentially. To ensure that we have consistent colors across both Unreal Engine and post-production side, we have to enable the color output in the settings. Go into the plus sign, search for color output, and remember that we created the OCR and configuration file. Here we have to assign that one. Just go into the configuration source, select it, and now we have to choose the source and the destination. The source has to be the REC 709 because that's what we are using in the Unreal Engine. And for the transform destination, we have to use the ASUS one. Same, the same thing what we've done with the viewport. So when we have this one, we just have to finally enable the OCIO. So it's going to take it with effect in the renderings. So with this one, we not just preview it properly in the viewport, but we also render it out correctly with the renders. To render out the shot, it's going to be relatively easy to do it. You just have to select the level sequence and the configuration file that you previously defined and hit local render. It's going to open up a new terminal and based on your settings, what you define there, it's going to take either long or short amount of time. When the render is done, you can just click on the output folder and it's going to show you all the output files. Another amazing thing that we are able to do with Move Render Queue that we can override some of the settings that we define in the master configuration in the shot level. So in this case, we have the configuration test and in the anti-aliasing, I have a spatial sample and temporal sample one and one. I want to keep all the settings what I defined here for the master configuration, but for the shot settings, I want to override just the anti-aliasing. So if I click here and then anti-aliasing, and I increase the temporal level to eight and I accept it. When I hit raw color render, notice that in the frames for the subsample is going to actually use eight instead of one. So the last topic that I want to cover is rendering with path tracer in move render queue. Usually we render out with deferred rendering and it is really good. However, if you want to have the utmost quality and the most precise lightning, you have to go with the path tracer. To enable it, go into the settings and in the rendering section, search for path tracer. You have to remove the default rendering because you no, no longer need it. And for the path tracer, enable reference motion blur because it's going to give you much better sense of realism. For anti-aliasing, you have to bump up the sample count quite some. So I would put 512 and also make sure to over, override anti-aliasing method and hit accept. When it is all done, click on the render local and it's going to render it out. So here's the comparison between the two rendering methods. On the left side, I have the path tracer and the right side, I have the deferred rendering. Here on the path tracer, we can see we have much better sense of realism because of the realistic lightning and reflections. However, on the right side in the deferred rendering, it still looks good, but it's not quite so much, especially when we are looking at reflective surfaces. So in this final section, we covered how to render out level sequences with Move Render Queue. That included how to create master configuration and shot configuration file, what are the key settings that you want to enable, 
such as anti-aliasing, color output, what are the proper output format that you want to go for for the cinematic production, and what is the difference using uh, deferred rendering and path tracer. Of course, this was a very general introduction to a very deep topic, and all of these settings could be explained in a detailed series itself, but I hope it gave you a general idea that what, you, what direction that you have to go for. What a journey we had until now. We covered everything that you need to know in order to bring your cinematic ideas to life in Unreal Engine. This included the proper project setup for cinematics, the proper shot structure for organization purposes, and the essential camera properties that you need to know. On top of all this, we learned about how to animate cameras and characters in level sequences, how to do post processes in Unreal, and finally how to render out all of them in a final output with movie render queue. I hope this tutorial made you a little bit of smarter and also more confident and a lot more excited to create your own cinematic world. So keep exploring, keep pushing the boundaries and most of all enjoy what you do.